truck and took all that stuff. You know how many people were here to vote? Not 100, not 50, not 40, not 30. You can count them on two hands. Ten people came out to vote for the uh, primary. Ten people. And I'm not sure where your voting area is, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I just want to encourage you to be involved in our electoral process because if we're going to sing songs like America, God shed his grace on thee. He's, he's allowed us to be citizens and to live in this time and uh, research our candidates and pray for them and vote. So let me encourage you to be involved in that way. Well, we're going to look at a, a prophet this morning in, in brief in the Old Testament. There's a prophet in the New Testament, John, but an Old Testament prophet by the name of Hosea. You ever hear of him? Can you find that book in your Bible? While you're looking there for our Hosea, I got my, my I, had, I had more time earlier to look right. I, can, I got my, my uh, bookmark here in it so I can find it easy. And uh, Hosea, we want to look at this unique prophet here in the Old Testament. But I was reading in Romans, and I found a great verse, and I just, I'm kind of all caught up in it, okay? And I, I want to use that as an introduction, just uh, while you're looking for Hosea chapter 1. Uh, Romans 15, 29 says, But I know that when I come to you, I shall come, and this is what he says, in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I thought, wow, when Paul was going to come to Rome on his way, he wanted to go on to Spain and so forth. But he says that he wants, uh, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And I thought, the blessing of the gospel. I thought, in what ways are, are the, is the gospel a blessing? And we could just start, if I had a whiteboard up here, we could just start listing ways that the gospel changes how much? Everything, doesn't it? And we can trust God for that, that uh, uh, the gospel makes a difference. And so I rejoice at that. The um, uh, Come, I shall come in the fullness of the go- blessing of the gospel. The come there is uh, um, past tense, as if it already happened. I shall come. And uh, the fullness speaks of replete or complete, the, the fullness. And the word blessing here in that verse is the word um, where we get eulogy, or fine speaking, talking about all those good things, the blessings of the gospel. And, of course, gospel means good news, and it's the good news of Christ the anointed one, and just a powerful and a precious verse. And so as we think about the gospel of Christ, we're going to look at Hosea and look at his experience with his wife and uh, the ups and the downs, mostly downs, and how he deals, how God instructs him to deal with Hosea, uh, Hosea to deal with Gomer, his wife, and then we're going to bring it back around to the gospel of Christ in 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 the latter half of the message just so you know where this is heading. And no half sheet today, but there's the example of liberty uh, we find in Hosea, and then we're going to look secondly at the establishment of our liberty, all right? So we're talking about liberty today on this 4th of July weekend. Uh, Fireworks, anybody seen fireworks yet this year? Uh, Anybody planning to go see some? Anybody hear anything going boom or seeing sparklers or anything? Yeah, quite a bit of that going on. Uh, late at our house last night, somebody across town was just going all out, and I thought, wow. Um, but, uh, you know, we think of the bombs bursting in air through that night and then the national uh, anthem being written from that poem. But uh, in 1776, the 13 British colonies in North America protested the limitations placed on them by the King of England and engaged in a struggle that gave birth to a brand new republic. The colonies adopted that now famous document known as the Declaration of Independence. Amen? And the lives uh, that have been lived after the Declaration of Independence in this country, and even ours today, are dramatically different because of that freedom from the the rule of England over America. And so we're going with that idea today of that freedom, and we're going to find here in the book of Hosea that there is going to come a, a beautiful wedding. And through that, and out of that difficulty, there's going to come a time when this husband is going to need to go and buy back his wife out of, as it were, slavery. It's not real clear as to what the buying back is, but he has to buy his wife back. And the Lord does that for us, to buy us to himself. 
Let's pray, and then we'll look to the Word. Lord, we thank you for the Scripture today. We pray that you will be our teacher and impress upon our hearts the truth of your Word, the application of it. We celebrate this weekend that you have been so good to our founding fathers and to the history of America. We pray that you will, uh, well, as we sang America uh, just a few moments ago, um, wow, about purifying our country. And Lord, we don't know what it's going to take to purify our country, to bring people to their knees, to cause people to admit sin, to cause people to repent of sin, uh, to cause people to turn back into a right way. We as a nation have uh, turned far from you, uh, not just in our practices and in our hearts, but also even in our laws are headed that direction now. We pray that, uh, Lord, as we confess our sin as, a, as citizens of this country, to a sinful country, we continue to pray for mercy upon our country, that you would be convicting and drawing us as citizens because we are the people that appoint our leaders, that our people would vote in people with uh, moral and right principles, and that even today you would be with our leaders wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, our president, our governor, our local leaders, that you would be with our Congress and our Supreme Court justices, that your hand would be upon them by the Holy Spirit to convict and to convince them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, to call them to yourself in salvation. You would send people their way to cross their paths, to speak truth, and that the Holy Spirit of God would open their mind and their heart that they'd be born again. We know that's your will, according to Timothy chapter 2. So we thank you today, Lord, that we can cry out for our leaders to that end. Help us to be able to continue to live a life in all peaceableness and gentleness, be able to spread the gospel in these ways. So here we are, Lord, praying for our country. Give our leaders good counsel and leading and help sin to be put down and righteousness to be raised up, that we the people would be a godly people. In Jesus' name, direct our time now in the Word. Amen. Here in Hosea, his name means salvation. If you found it yet, um, it's right after the book of Daniel. And his name means salvation. He had a very long ministry, some 50 years or longer. Uh, he was a contemporary of Amos, prophet Amos in the northern kingdom, and a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah, the prophets, who ministered in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now this is during the time of the divided kingdom, ten in the north, two in the south, after David and Solomon had the united kingdom. Hosea was uh, speaking to Israel what Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was to Judah in the south. Hosea looked forward prophetically to the Assyrian captivity when they would be carried off and the, the nation of Israel in the north to be no more as uh, dwelling there in the land. Uh, Jeremiah looked forward to the Babylonian captivity prophetically uh, of those two southern kingdoms, which happened later than the, the northern kingdoms being carried off. In the course of this prophecy, he was commanded to marry a lady named Gomer. And if you look there with me, Hosea chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Barry, which is different from what the, the Hosea we looked at in Family Bible Hour this morning. Uh, this is the son of Barry. And uh, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So those are the years that, that uh, Hosea's ministry was going on, quite a lengthy ministry. And we don't know how long the hardships of the book of Jeremiah went on for Hosea with a broken heart and struggling in his home life, and his home life was a, a public picture as a prophet. It was a public picture to, to Israel of, of the idolatry and the uh, immorality of uh, God's people, Israel, God being the groom and uh, Israel being his people, his bride as it were. There in the Old Testament, different from the New Testament, of course. So uh, verse 2 says, When the Lord began to speak, to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. And so just as he was to take a wife 
Here's a prophet of God. Can you imagine this? I mean, just imagine for the, this is the first time you've ever heard this. Here's a prophet of God. You know, picture Isaiah or uh, some other great man. And uh, they're, they're going to be speaking for God. And he says, go take a wife of harlotry. Because that's what my people have done. That's what Israel has done. You're going to be a picture. They have committed spiritual idolatry and all types of wickedness. And turned from me. Three points. Uh, first of all, well, notice the example of liberty. No, first of all, of three points, she is wayward while her husband is faithful. She is wayward while her husband is faithful. It says, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. So here he is, a faithful man, and yet she is doing wrong as his wife. She is living immorally. Well, in the process, as he takes this, this woman as his wife, Gomer, verse 3, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son, one of three children that's mentioned here in this passage. Let's read on. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, and bring an end of the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Why? Why? Because God says, I'm going to bring vengeance back upon Jezreel. And so the child's named Jezreel, the city where Jehu, being obedient to God, had um, not only overthrown the king ahead of him, and uh, was destroying many wi destroying uh, wicked, but he, he wrote them a letter. It's a long story. It's great reading back in Kings. I don't have time to explain it all. But he went. <clears throat> Anyways, my, my uh, understanding of it is he went overboard. Or the Jezreelites went overboard. Uh, King uh, Ahaz, I believe it was, had 70 sons in Jezreel. And when he killed uh, Ahaz, he says, you appoint one of Ahaz's sons to be in charge because we're coming up there. And Jezreel's up here going, man, life, the king's army couldn't stand against them. How's the king's sons going to rally uh, Jezreel here and we're going to be able to defeat Jehu and, and all this? And they said, no, no, whatever you want, we'll do, Jehu. And, and Jehu sends him a letter says, well, the, the king's 70 sons, bring his heads down here in a cart and put them on each side of the gate in heaps. And that's what they did. Jezreel slew the innocent, the 70 sons, 70 sons. God didn't forget about that. Justice is being served. And so, um, Jehu comes out the next day and, and he says, uh, I, I killed, I can't remember the reference now, but he says, I, I, I killed the king, but who killed all these? I don't know what Jehu's intentions was in sending that letter because it says, uh, in verse 31 at the end of that chapter in 2 Kings, I believe it is, that um, he did the, the will of the Lord and some of the things he was stepping up to do. But now we find that there is judgment, and he says, you know what, Israel? You really overdid it, uh, Jezreel in particu particular, because you killed these 70 sons, the, uh, the bloodshed of Jezreel there in verse 4, in the middle of the verse, of the house of Jehu, and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. You're going to carry them off because they had done wrong, and that was a testimony. So here, uh, here's um, Hosea, his wife Gomer, they have this little baby, they, Jezreel. That's the first one. It's a testament. Wherever he went, he was carrying the remembrance that you guys overdid it, and now you're going to be judged for it. Oh, they preached, you could repent and turn back. We, we find that they, they didn't. I think that was in 2 Kings 10, a lot of that. Um, so she can, uh, let's, let's continue on. Uh, verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, okay, it was a son first, Jezreel, now it's a daughter. It says, call her name Loramah of the house of Israel. It says, for I want, let me read that again. Call her name Loramah, I can't say it now. I practiced just so I could say it. Ruamah, there we go. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. You see that? I'll no longer have mercy. So name the daughter's name, this name. And when she went around, they understood it. no mercy. There's not going to be mercy anymore. I've been merciful for a long time. How long has God been merciful with you and with America? With me. 
God says there's coming a time when there's not going to be any mercy. Justice will fall. And so there's this child named No Mercy. It goes on to say here in verse 6, uh, For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Will save them by the Lord their God. And will not save them by bow, nor by spear, sword, or battle. By horses or horsemen. God was continuing to have mercy on Judah for a further time. But there was a time coming when Judah would be carried off as well. That's another prophet's message. And then we find a third child, verse 8. But when she had weaned Lo Ruamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God, su- or God said, call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. So he he gives a promise of hope here with that. Even though he says, not only is there Jezreel, and I'm going to remember the the, uh, guilt and the blood, he says there's no mercy. And then he has the third son, which is named, Not My People. And so it's very serious here that there's a wayward uh, uh, wife here of harlotry, and a husband is continuing to be faithful and obeying God and naming the children these names and prophesying this ministry. Well, let's jump over to verse 2. Notice our second point. She is not only wayward while her husband's faithful, but she is wandering while her husband is providing. She's wandering while her husband is providing. Chapter 2, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother, Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Brings this charge that she has uh, gone away from her husband. She leaves her husband. She plays the harlot. Down in verse 5 it says, For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved how? Shamefully. So she's playing the harlot. She's behaving shamefully. Verse 5. And she said, I will go after my lovers. Here she adamantly persists in her evil. She is determined to do what she wants. And she is wandering. She leaves her husband to do her own thing. And she thinks that it's going to be good that way. It says, who gave me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. She believes that all of these good things she's getting out there running around on her husband, Hosea. Let's jump over to chapter 5, verse 7, just for a moment. Because when we do that, it affects our family. It affects our children, the way we live. 5, 7 says, they have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten, what? Pagan children. How could they be, beget pagan children? Their hearts aren't right with God, and they're doing things just like Gomer here, going away from Hosea and living. Can you imagine? Here's a prophet, and his, his, the prophet's wife, or the, we'll put it this way, the pastor's wife left and is out running around, sleeping around, and thinking that she's getting further ahead. You know, I'm not picking on women. It could be the other way around, the man, right? But she's played the harlot. She's been shameful, and she's determined to go after her lovers, and she thinks that they're the ones that's giving her the bread and the water. But notice what the husband's doing in verse 6. Although she has left her husband, he is providing lovingly for her needs. Therefore, behold, verse 6 says of chapter 2, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her path. Here Hosea is trying to make it difficult for her, trying to show her that it's not the way to live, to deter her sinfulness. And then verse 7, she she will chase her lovers but not overtake them. The very sin that she's trying to find is not going to work. Yes, she shall seek them, but not find them. Isn't that the way sin is? The world, we try to run around and do something with the world. And you know what? The world doesn't care about you. 
The ungodly don't care about how it goes for you. Oh, it'll be a friend for a while. Remember the prodigal son? When he had all the father's money, man, he was throwing a party every night, you might say. Living all the good things, but when the money dried up, where'd the friends go? Just careful who your friends are. Maybe it's because of what they can get out of us. And the world is not the kind of people we want to be following. We want to follow the Lord. And so here's Gomer that's uh, running around, and he's trying to, trying to direct this thing, trying to make a difference, trying to, to uh, bring her to an end sooner than later on this tragic path of destruction. There in verse 7 it says, Then she will say, halfway through the verse, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me. And then she comes to her senses. She realizes. Verse 8. Notice what verse 8 says. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will take the return and take away my grain in its time, and my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Wow. Is this friend providing for her? Is this people that she's seeking after, her lovers? Is that lover providing for her? No. It was, it was Hosea that was there and caring for her needs, and it was God that was providing for Israel, and it's God that provides for us, not the sin around us, not the worldly ways, not the devil. See, the devil ever has done anything good for you? He'll give us that much if he can slip the noose over our head and yank it tight. Places of sin for a season. Moses rejected them, didn't he? He had his eyes on God. Let us be the same way. Here is Hosea, provided all these things, but now he's drawing them back so that, that, that she will be in need and realize of his great love and turn back. And God deals with us at times. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about God's chastening when we've sinned. Oh, he'll convict us. He'll call us when we've sinned. If we're his children, he'll, he'll be drawing us to himself by the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. But if we persist in doing our own thing, he may need to chasten us to draw us back into his way. And if we can go on our way and it doesn't matter and nothing ever happens, maybe we're not saved. Or God says he will chasten. And so here he's the one that's, even though she's living over with, with her lovers, he's the one that's been providing for her. He's the one that's been giving the covering. He's the one, the one meeting their needs. And we can say, oh, God, thank you. You've been so patient and merciful with me. Amen? And you, when we go wrong, God's there. She's wandering, but her husband's providing and faithful and caring. Notice also, thirdly, she is bound while her husband brings freedom. She is bound while her husband brings freedom. Now, what's that? Let's look at uh, chapter 2. Um, verse 8, it says, I will return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. And so that, that, was, a, that was a good thing that um, she was returning but apparently, she, this many 50 years of ministry, of this life of Hosea, that it was a, maybe from time to time, there were times that when she went away back into uh, harlotries, as is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13 says, chapter 2, verse 13, I will punish her for the days of the Baal of which she burned incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry, and she went after lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. She's in bondage to all of these things. Let's keep reading. Chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, 1 and 2, when we really get down to this bondage thing. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look on other gods and love the cakes, the raisin cakes of the pagans. Verse 2 says, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. He went and bought her. 
If it wasn't for him covering her, she wouldn't have been covered. If it wasn't for him bringing the gold and the silver and, and the food and all of these things, the wool, she would have had nothing. This lover was not providing for her. Assyria was not providing, and Egypt was not providing for Israel. And I'll tell you, the world's not providing for you either. If we're blessed, it's because every good and perfect gift comes from above. Let's remember that. Let's look to God. And so what does he do? He's not only working this program to, to bring her to an end of herself out here in her nakedness and her hunger and her need, and she thinks she's getting along, and all of that corruption outwardly and inwardly of her heart and of her mind, and those burdens, she thinks she's getting along. What's the matter with us people? We think sin's good. Huh? What's the matter with us? Boy, we're, we're something sometimes, aren't we? But we're just like her. But God steps in, and God's loving Israel, and God loves you, and he loves me. And so it says he bought her. He paid the price. We can picture. Did you ever see pictures of slave trade and how they'd have them in chains, and they're, they're not clothed well, if at all? And there's that dirt. Maybe they try to get them cleaned up a little bit. You can tell, though, that they're a wreck and they have, you know, the hair and, and all of that. Slave trade. And they're, they're up here on, the, on a platform and they got them kind of drug out there and crack them with a stick a little bit. Stand up straighter, you know. And uh, can you picture the whole slavery thing? Here's Gomer. Here's his wife. Got herself caught up and she is as a slave. And he goes and he buys her out of that. Buys her back to himself. And it's like... God saying to Israel, and like God saying to us, I love you, I care for you. These lovers that you're toying with down here, your harlotries, stop the idolatry. Turn from the idols. Make me first in your life. Walk with me. Serve me. Live for me. Amen? Get, out, get rid of this sin in our life. Get, that, get those thoughts out of our mind. Get those priorities pushed aside and live for God. It's all right there. So I bought her, he says. God's paid the price for you and for me too. He's loved Israel repeatedly. We've got chapter after chapter, book after book of prophets in here where God is reaching out to Israel and God's reaching out to you and me. He bought her. Oh, she's bound while her husband brings her freedom, sets her free, brings her back home. He buys her back. What was it the price for your sin and mine to buy us back to God, to get us right with our creator again, us sinners down here? For all have sinned. The wage of sin is death. What did it take for us to die? Couldn't be a good man standing up for you or you dying for me. or you, I got my own to worry about. But there's one that came. Jesus Christ that died for us upon the cross. Paid the price in full. So that we could be saved. When we call, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you tell somebody that this week? Talk to them about, hey, well, how was your 4th of July? Oh, man, this country, we got the liberty, we're so blessed. You have liberty in Christ? You go, what? You swearing or what? What'd you say? And, uh, no, because we're in the habit of not swearing, right? We have a good testimony. We can talk to them about Jesus. I mean, do you, do you love the people you work with and the people you see that much? I, I find that I'm awful quiet unless I really get thinking about it. You know, there's a, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun is the saying we use, right? So we love them enough to tell them something about that. Talk to them about that. Somebody's got to tell them sometimes. Somebody's got to love them enough to tell them. Do we love them enough? Or are we just going to kind of like, you know, hey, how you doing? It's nice hanging out at the water cooler with you. And see ya. I'll help you. You know, battery's dead. Let me jump that for you. Good enough. See ya. I was down to Newfield for a wedding yesterday, and we went by the, our house. They have gutted the place. And they've got all this stuff going on. And she says, can you show me where the corner markers are? And they're staked. I took her and showed her one corner and then another. We ended up walking all around. And, and um, I tried to talk to her about the Lord a little bit. I don't know. I just like scattering seed. And, and then she's got, well, I got to, you know, everything's happening. But I thought, do I care enough to talk to people about the Lord? I care because Christ paid the price. Here's Hosea. He bought her and he paid for it. Notice what he does next. Fourthly. She is blessed while her husband cares for her. Fourthly, she is blessed while her husband cares for her. Chapter 3, verse 2 goes on. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. In other words, the idea here is don't give up. Don't give up. That's the word I get from that. Don't give up. If he, whatever he had to pay, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's a covenant of marriage. Amen? Don't give up. It's a covenant. 
it's not just, uh, you just didn't sign um, your kid's excuse for school. Yep, they're going to be late today. It's fine. I sign their paper, send it back. It doesn't touch, you know? It's not that. And it's not just that you signed the marriage certificate, your marriage license. It's not just that you signed that. This is an agreement that we said with our own mouth, our own tongue, before God and man, that we would be committed to our spouse. And this man, Hosea, it has an easy life, doesn't he? He has a wonderful marriage. He doesn't. He's heartbroken. He's trying to raise these kids. He's trying to be a prophet of all things. And he buys her back. Notice what he does with her. Uh, chapter 2, verse 14. Let's flip back to this passage. It's just a wonderful uh, set of verses here. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, allure her with special treatment, we might say. Simplifying things, it says, allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. Wilderness is a, a roomy area. Some, sometimes we need to make room for our spouse. Our spouse, that's not, let me make that singular. For our spouse, right? Yeah, God designed one man and one woman, just one. Uh, I'm speaking collectively of us, for, right? Uh, bring her into a wilderness. We need to sometimes just take our, our spouse and get away, whether it's our husband or our wife. And um, behold, I will allure. The idea of allure here is, um, speaks of uh, enticing. It can be used in a good or a bad sense. Obviously, in this sense, you're alluring your spouse. That's a good thing, enticing them, right? Win, win, are we winful to our spouse? Are we winsome? Are we hard to live with? Archie Bunker. Eat up! You watch Archie Bunker? Somebody, I, I, I thought it was hilarious the other day, somebody had that as their picture on Facebook. Instead of their own picture, they had Archie Bunker's picture. Is that how we are to live with? Are we gentle and kind and good? I will allure her and will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. Are your words comforting or cutting? Healing or injuring? Oh, God, help us to control our tongue, control our heart and our mind. We're going to have to be in the word of God, maybe. We're going to have to pray more. We're going to have to fight hard. Let's fight for our marriages. We had to fight to... To, to get them to marry us in the first place, right? Let's fight to stay married now, amen? Let's work on these things. Sometimes we get a little kooky. I know I do. And, you know, we get out of sorts or whatever, get an attitude, or maybe we didn't sleep well, whatever it is. God help us to be good husbands, good wives. Let's work on it. It takes work for marriage. Let's look at uh, verse 14 uh, here at the end. Comfort, uh, verse 15. I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as the door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. He gives her hope. He gives her some, some, uh, uh, something to hope on. You know, that's one of the good things about vacation. You say, hey, let's plan something. Let's get away for our our anniversary, or let's, let's, let's go off and go do, let's go see this fireworks, and, and don't plan it like right away, like let's drop and go, that's good too, but you know, in September when the leaves are turning, you paint the picture for them, let's, let's go and do this, and get it on the calendar, it gives us something to look forward to, because often days are kind of hard, and we might need something to look forward to, oh we're looking forward to heaven, yes, but we don't know when that's going to come, or it might come at any moment, but let's keep our eyes and I set some things ahead of us. Let's keep reading. So there's hope, and she has a song. And do you have music in your home? Do you sing? Are you encouraging your spouse to sing, or is it, Edith? Yeah. What, yes, Archie, what do you need, right? Can you pick? I mean, wow. Where's the song there? Uh, verse 16. We better move along. Get off of that one, right? Um, and it came, or, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Is that what she's been calling him all this time? She didn't really care for him or whatever? Yes, master. Uh -huh. If Jose is doing all this to love her and serve her, he wasn't that kind of archy kind of guy. He's a guy that cared for his spouse and was covering her and all doing all these things, and God's caring for Israel and all these things. No longer call me 
uh, master. You'll call me husband. Praise the Lord. Are you developing a, that growing intimacy with your spouse, not just physically, but relationally and in your, your care and your heart? I want to ask you, are you praying together with your spouse? If you're not, red flag time. If you're not praying with your spouse, I'm just, just saying, I'm not trying to cause trouble, just saying, if you're not praying with your spouse, that's something that would be good to do because that really, 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 really helps to pray with your spouse. All right, develop that intimacy. Verse 17, for I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. Okay? He's working to overcome long-standing obstacles. And maybe your marriage has some long-standing obstacles. Work hard, be patient, and change that she'll forget about the Baals. Forget about the idols. Forget about those old things. Maybe, you know, maybe you and I, we failed before. Let's work to earn our trust. Let's work to earn that love. Let's work and work and work and sacrifice for our spouse. Overcome those obstacles. Make it happen, right? Make it happen. Get in there. Marriage is work, and that's a good thing. We're working for something good. Our spouse is worth it. Verse 18. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the birds of the air and with the creeping things of the ground. Have an unwavering dedication to that covenant. And thank God we have the new covenant and um, uh, we have a Savior named Jesus Christ. Let's jump over to uh, chapter 4, verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6. In our marriage, we need to be working on a knowledge basis, communicating with our spouse, talking about things. It says here in verse 6, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Might I say right here, I, I commend you for being in church today to get knowledge. You're going to know more about Hosea than what you did probably coming in maybe, or at least be reminded of it. Okay? And we need to be in church. I want to challenge you. Make a commitment to be in church every Sunday. Can I encourage you to family Bible hour, too, and for prayer meeting? Let's be out. Let's be about the word. People are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being a priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. Serious words. Let's teach our children the right ways. Let's live the right ways that they'll understand. Let me take you to another verse. You'll jump over with me to Galatians. It's not going to be real long. I can't promise you that, but um, I don't intend it to be real long. There's just one verse I want to look at with you over here. Galatians chapter 5. Not only is there the uh, liberty that we have here with that uh, Gomer is blessed with, uh, with Hosea's purchase, but over here in Galatians 1, in verse 1, there's the establishment of our liberty. Notice what it says here in 5.1. Would you read uh, Galatians 5 and verse 1 with me out loud? Ready? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Okay? There's some things here. We are redeemed from something. What are we redeemed from? It says here liberty, doesn't it? Made you free? Um, do not be in, uh, from the, um, there at the end of the verse, from the yoke of bondage. Folks, we were in the yoke of bondage under the law that condemned us and bondage that we were dead in trespasses and sin with no hope. So we're redeemed from something. Our word is redeemed here that we're thinking about being bought out of, having that liberty. We're redeemed by something. What are we redeemed by? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. He has made us free. That's how we're redeemed. Just as, just as Gomer was naked and, and unclothed and, or uncovered and um, needy, and here's Hosea coming and giving all these things again and again, and then he finally pulls back from all that. He says, you know what? There you are. You're in need. So God is dealing with us in our need, and he goes to the cross for us. Romans 3.25 says, For God set forth, as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. It's by his blood that he died. Ephesians 1, 7, 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It was Christ that's made us free. So there's a redeeming from something, from the slave block where we were in slavery to sin. We're taken down off of that. How are we taken down off that? By the blood of Christ, what he did for us. But we are so saved to something. It says, stand fast therefore in the liberty for which Christ has made us free, 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 and don't be tangled again in that yoke of bondage. He's brought a, there's a Greek word that bear out, that we've not only been bought out of that slavery, but there's a word that bears out that we have been bought out to become a slave no more. We will never go back to that slave block because of what Christ did for us. We are free. We are free. But you know what? It moves us to something. It moves us to something. It moves us, uh, or, or people are redeemed for something, is the way I want to say it. People are redeemed for something, and they are called to renounce that freedom for uh, that slavery. It says here, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Stand. You see, although we've been set free, we are to, we are to stay free. Why, why, uh, why would uh, Gomer go back away from all the things that Hosea is able and is providing for her? Why would she go astray? Why do we go astray? We need to stand fast, not get over here where we're going to destroy ourselves in sin. Stand fast in that liberty. There's a man, Olav Olvason, was a free citizen in Sweden. But he found himself hard-pressed for money, so in desperation, he sold his body for medical research to an institute in Stockholm in 1910. A year later, he inherited a fortune, so he tried to buy himself back. The institute refused to sell him his rights to his own body. And in a lawsuit, they retained possession of his very body. The institute even collected damages from him because he had two teeth extracted without permission. Can you imagine? But he sold himself as a slave. You know what? We're slaves. But we're not stuck like Olaf here, a Sweden was. Jesus Christ has brought us out of it. And he says, don't go back anymore. Don't go back anymore. He can break all of that binding that Satan has put all these ropes of sin around us. All of this trouble, all of these burdens. He says, you can't get away from me. You can't get, you're not worthy to be forgiven. There's no way you can get free. But Jesus Christ cuts through all that and sets us free. On this weekend of liberty, may we be, may I challenge you to be like one of the prophets, that you would be like Hosea, and that we would work hard for our spouse and that we will rejoice in the blood of Christ that died for us, and that we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, that we would pour ourselves in to being obedient to him and fighting against our own fleshly tendencies to be weak and proud and sinful and to say no and keep our eyes on the Lord and walk in that straight and narrow way. Amen? Live for him. Maybe there's temptations that you struggle with. You know yourself, I know myself. That We have to keep focused and be, as the, the Bible term, sober about things of righteousness and live for God. Amen? Because we are so blessed. We're celebrating liberty. The liberty that Gomer found and also our spiritual liberty in Christ. Will you celebrate freedom? And if so, maybe there's some bondage that's trying to re-shackle you again. Will you take that to the Lord and say, God, I've, I've failed, I've sinned, I, I've been, or I've been tempted. This is an area of my life I want to continue to keep guard and set a watch. Lord, will you cleanse me and forgive me? Help me to be more godly in this way. Help me to be more like Hosea. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you, upon the cross, said it is finished, and you declared our independence from the slavery and death and bondage and hell and the lake of fire and eternal torment of gnashing of teeth, of shrieks and screams and of pain and of blackness, of darkness and torment that we can't even begin to imagine, that we deserve because we are wicked and ungodly and a self-willed people, stiff-necked people, just like Israel was in the Old Testament. 
But we have a loving Savior that though you made us in your image and set mankind in the garden in a perfect place, yet we rebelled and sinned. You gave us conscience, but we rebelled. You gave us human government, but we rebelled. You gave us the law, but we rebelled. You even gave us the age of grace that we're in now, and yet we don't make use of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the power that we have to live godly. But Lord, you love us. You care for us. I pray that you'll give us victory in our taking a stand for you to put off wickedness, whether it's harlotries or harlotries of the eyes or of the mind, whether it be some other sin or whether it's a harsh tongue. Help us to be more like Hosea that was kind and gentle and alluring. Help us be more like you, Lord. In this moment, we decide to stand fast. We don't know why we'd go back to that slavery. We don't know why we'd leave our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, for sin. We know and we affirm that the devil just wants to give us garbage and artificial shiny toys that break and are worthless and we hurt ourselves on them. Help us be faithful. We want to worship and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you living for the Lord? Are you pushing forward in godliness?